Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon and welcome to The Post 36 Publishing Productivity for PhD Students. Oh yes, and this is one of our triage posts where we've got an urgent request and I deliver an urgent response. And this urgent request comes from one of our dear friends, Ella Wright. Love you, Ella. You know it, you know it, you know it. Now, Ella approached me and had a problem. She knows she has to finish the PhD quickly, but she also knows that she's got to be productive with her publishing, and she wants to know how to sort of make those choices. Well, Ella, your wish is my command. You are a legendary human. I'm so grateful that you're in my life. But let me try and explain that that's a false binary opposition, but let me start firstly with why you are right. You need to get this PhD done quickly. There are three reasons. First reason, you are competing with the world. So when you are applying for jobs and someone has finished a PhD in three or four years and you've finished a PhD in six or seven years, who are they going to hire? Okay, so a PhD is a proxy for can you understand deadlines? Are you a self-starter? Do you complete what you start? Yep, but there's a second reason. Our universities are very, very unstable at the moment. Academic staff are retiring, they're being restructured out of the organisation, they're resigning and going to other posts. So the longer that you enrol in a PhD, the less likely your supervisory team, your advising team, will be intact. And finally, El Mané. Money. Now, a lot of you are on scholarships or stipends of some form. Okay. And as a former dean, let me tell you about a train wreck of what happens. If you don't match the length of your funding source, so the scholarship, with the length of your supervision and completion of your PhD, so you, in other words, you don't finish the PhD when the scholarship finishes, the consequences of that to you, to your family, to your mental health, I cannot convey in words. So make your funding stream, your scholarship, align with the length of your research, full stop. And of course, for the majority of students, you are doing a PhD without a scholarship, without a stipend of any kind. And you have to finish quickly so you can get on with the rest of your life and you can stop your family suffering, okay? The thing about a quick PhD is it allows your family, your partner, your friends to help you, but then know that this pain, this suffering is going to end. Okay, so, and also the drain on the resources from the family can end as well. So therefore, I would argue that a quick PhD is not negotiable. You've got to get this thing started and you've got to get this thing finished as quickly as possible. And of course, you finish the PhD, that's how you're going to be competitive for all sorts of jobs inside and outside of higher education. But the problem is then publishing, isn't it? And I have to note, and I'm going to tell a difficult truth here, that three or four or five published articles during a PhD, that's not going to be enough these days to get you a job. Now, this is what few supervisors, advisors are telling students, because to be frank, it's not in the supervisor's interests to tell students this. That's why so many of these supervisors want this PhD by publication. And I'm gonna tell some very tough truths about the PhD by, by publication today. Remember, why certain supervisors love the PhD by publication is that the student produces three or four or five articles. The supervisor's name are on those articles. Remember, they've got five students. So they're able to, in a Fordist fashion, get their name on students' work. The quality of your thesis and your productivity after the PhD has been completed, that's not of their concern. They don't gain from that. Yep. So I want something different for you. I want the PhD to be a powerhouse for you, an engine room of your entire career. And I'm going to talk about today all sorts of dissemination and publishing options for you. So finishing a PhD and being efficient on the way through, absolutely crucial, not negotiable. 
But this area, this topic is so meaningful to me for many reasons. And why I've become so staunch, I think, about the importance of students publishing a great deal beyond their supervisors, therefore beyond the PhD by publication, is I've seen how the PhD by publication has destroyed students' lives. Let me tell you a story. Never told the story in public before. Must not cry. Okay. Uh, I was a head of school and I was conducting the annual performance reviews as we do for all staff. And I was with this wonderful, wonderful staff member, legendary human being, adore her. And she was crying within two minutes of this annual performance review beginning. She was devastated. And I just sort of had to work out why. Sort of the performance review was the least of our worries. We were having a, a damaged very frightened, upset human in front of me what was going on. So I said to her, you've got so much to celebrate. You've completed your PhD this year while in full-time work with a family. Let's celebrate that. And she said with a shaking voice, this PhD was a pointless qualification. And I said, why? Why is it pointless? And she said, I've finished a PhD I've only got partial authorship credit for five of the articles that were in the PhD, and that's all I've got. I wrote them, and I only got partial authorship credit. Now, everything in the PhD has already been published, and even after the PhD, I am below the benchmark of what this university says is publishing, is research activity. And now, with everything published in this PhD, I have to start again from nothing. I've got to be research active after everything I've already done for three years has been published. Now this wonderful woman in her mid to late 50s left academia and left that university the following year. It simply was too much for her. I'm going to say she is a great human being. So with all the critiques of the traditional thesis about its size and its bagginess, remember that you've got all sorts of words on the page of that traditional PhD with all sorts of options for publishing that can come from it. It is the gift of not only your short-term academic career, but your medium-term academic career. To give you some sense of it, I got 11 11, 11 articles out of my PhD and I was able to still be using outtakes from the doctorate five years after I graduated. It was the gift that just keeps on giving. I still pick up citations from that work. But think about my other qualifications. I got two refereed articles out of my master's by research, two articles unbelievably from my coursework master's dissertation five articles and a book from my education masters. And by the way, that book was The University of Google, probably the book I am best known for. I got three refereed articles and a short story <laughs> out of my graduate diploma of gastronomic tourism. I got five articles from my graduate diploma in internet studies and two articles from my masters of leadership and counting. And I reckon there's two more articles at least to come out of that next year. Now, through my career, I have 250 refereed articles and book chapters, and I'm about to publish my 21st book. And about 80% of my publications are singly authored and all my co-authorships through my entire career except for one example where I wrote with a pro vice chancellor mm -hmm, every single co-authorship has been ethical and abiding by the code of research conduct of that time now I'm telling you this because very frequently I'm dismissed people go oh, all Tara cares about is the PhD she doesn't care about publication dude Dude, if someone didn't care about publication, would they have 250 articles? Come on. So let's talk about stopping this inelegant 
and wrong binary opposition of completing the PhD quickly and disseminating from it, producing refereed articles. They're not a binary opposition. Today, I'm going to give you options to make it all work together because the world is changing very quickly. We are living through an accelerated academic life. And the old rules about gift authorship, lab authorship, I got the grant, therefore I'm on the paper, all that stuff's gone. It's in breach of the code. It's gone. So what we are left with today is a plan to finish your PhD and a publishing plan, a dissemination plan. But I'm particularly focusing on academic publishing today. All sorts of dissemination community-wide is possible, but today it's academic publishing because that's what Ella wanted. Now, I know the PhD by publication seems terrific because students go, oh, I've got three. I've got five publications out of my thesis. But remember the story from my former colleague. Okay, so you got three or five publications out of that thesis. But what's next? What are you going to publish on immediately that you finish the PhD? And remember, and a lot of those PhD by publications, you're only getting par partial authorship credit for, let's be honest, articles that you wrote. Okay, so what I'm proposing today is a deep data mining of your thesis to squeeze every single paper we can to create an incredible career from the thesis from the candidature now i've got three maxims or assumptions that i'm going actually four assumptions or maxims that i'm going to apply today one my maxim is a finished article is better than a perfect article if you're waiting for a perfect article hell will freeze over research is a photograph of you today accept that photograph of you today knowing that tomorrow you'll look different two published is better than under review so when you're putting articles into a journal check their robust and rapid refereeing process three Aim for platinum open access always. We'll talk about that in a second. Platinum open access. And four, do not let the endless chatter and conversations about the metrics of journals and journal ranking block you from the goal of being published. Okay, so Ella, let's get your publishing show on the road, girlfriend. Let's do this. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to, I mean, this is a, a whole of career plan I'm offering today. I'm going to give you 16 quick suggestions for you to use today and tomorrow in this particular point of your career. So out of these 16, if they fit, grab them, use them in your career. Okay, let's do this. So what we're aiming for is we're going to do lots of publications. We're going to move you from zero to hero today. Let's do it. One. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Go through every assignment, thesis, and capstone presentation in your undergraduate, your capstone, and your master's qualifications. So go through every assignment, every thesis that you've written before you entered the PhD. So our first strategy is to look at what you already have. Look at the writing you did before the doctorate. Now, there may not be much there, okay, and that's cool, but there could be something there. And if there is, maybe there's an assignment, there's a fragment of something, but it's incomplete. See if you can write the rest of it, lift the standard, a bit and get it out. Conversely, you can talk about this sort of 3,000 words, this assignment or whatever, with your supervisor and they may be willing to write the other half for you. Lift it standard and get it, get it published. Now, there is nothing to lose <laughs> by giving this a go. This research is sitting on your hard drive. It's doing nothing. So make the nothing into something and get it published. Two, if a chapter in your thesis can become an article with a day's work, do it now. Now, the fastest way to move thesis research into publications is to write a chapter that is large and expansive, certainly, but is focused on a particular idea. Now, those chapters can be very quickly configured into articles. So when I work with my students, 
in the first meeting I have with them when we're working on the contents page of the thesis that they're about to write, I always make sure that we have about five or about eight chapters that can become articles with one day's work. So this means that the thesis is given its due. This is the important bit of this story. That means you are writing a chapter and that chapter has its research that is aligned with research questions. So it's ready to proceed to examination. It is a well-drafted chapter, full stop. But then, the next day, scoop out this completed chapter from the thesis, save it as an article with a new punchy and very sexy title, and then do a find and replace. So when you find thesis, put in article. When you find PhD, replace it with article and give it a draft. Draft in one day, tighten it up. What'll happen is it'll reduce in length, probably about a thousand or two thousand words, write an abstract, and submit it to a journal. So today, today, look at your completed chapters and are there any of them with a day's work that could go to a publisher? And if you're about to start your thesis, then ensure when you're planning out what your thesis might look like, that there are discrete chapters that can become articles quickly. So think about the inverse situation where so much goes wrong. So students start, instead of starting by writing a chapter for a thesis, they start by, I'm going to write an article. Are you? I'm going to write an article. And then they have all these problems trying to integrate that article into their thesis. Yeah, you've got an overlap of methodology. What's going on here? So that it's always easier to cut down an already existing chapter into an article than to write up an article into a PhD thesis, okay? It's much faster, it's much better for the thesis to do your best work on the PhD chapter and then make sure the chapter is nested into the argument and then cut it out of the thesis. Set it free and get yourself a published article. Boom. Three. Platinum open access always. Now I know we have all sorts of metrics and journal rankings that are going on at the moment and look so many of, and we know this, so many of these metrics and rankings have been critiqued. I basically live in Retraction Watch, it's my favourite website and if you look at Retraction Watch you see all the journals, supposedly tier one, Tier 1 journals um, that magically have all these retractions from them. Mm -hmm. Look at the thousands of dollars and pounds and euros and on we go that corporate commercial publishers use and deploy to create open access. The money they take from people to create open access. And look at how much research these corporate publishers hide behind a credit card. Now you'll notice none of these issues are considered in any of these metrics or rankings. Now, you are a PhD student. The people that are going to hire you, the people that are going to fund you, need to read your work. So the priority for you, the priority for me, is Platinum Open Access Journals. Now, if you haven't come across that phrase before, let's do it quickly. Platinum Open Access Journals are open access refereed research and it's freely available to readers and to authors to publish. Okay? Platinum Open Access. Now, Gold Open Access, they're the, the free to release the research outputs without delay, so free to the reader. But the author supposedly has to pay. And what's the phrase they're using now? Author processing fee or processing charge. If the manuscript is accepted, the writer has to pay money so that the reader can read it for free. And then, of course, there's green open access where the publishers enforce a delay or an embargo on the research output and only pre-publications are available in an institutional repository. Okay, but remember that digitization has changed everything in publishing, everything. Very expensive analog tasks either completely disappeared or were incredibly truncated through digitization. So distribution costs, for 
example, disappeared. You no longer have to pay for postage to get a journal sent to you, okay? It's delivered to your laptop or to your desktop. So why does open access matter so much? Firstly, open access is a way to address social injustice. The posh universities, the posh institutions pay the posh subscriptions to control the dissemination of knowledge. But academics are paid by the public purse, and I would argue our ideas should be available for public access. And further, think about it. With the corporate publishing models, the taxpayer is paying over and over and over again for this research. Academics complete our research as part of our publicly funded salary. We complete the refereeing, the peer review work, as part of our publicly funded salary. Commercial publishers then use this free labour to then charge universities a third time to buy back the research that the academics gave their labour for free. Wow. So Carla Strebe and Julia Blixrud really studied this situation and they stated, quote, this is unbelievable, quote, commercial publisher revenue reports continue to suggest that scholarly journals are among the most impressively profitable products produced by the free market. <laughs> End of quote. That's what happens when the labour's free. It's all profit, girlfriend. Okay, so let's talk about you, therefore. Let's talk about PhD students, early career, career researchers, to be frank, all of us. Open access means that a range of communities can read your research, and that's particularly beyond people employed in universities. Be really, really careful of these article processing charges or fees. This is an attempt to shift the payment from readers, where it used to be, to authors. This used to be called vanity publishing when I was a lass. And there is an argument that publishers are encouraged to make profit by accepting your article. So it impacts on peer review. Okay, now I've published 250 refereed articles and book chapters and I started publishing in 1993 before most of you were even born and 90%, 90% of my articles are in platinum open access journals. I have never paid for publishing ever. Now, this is the important bit. Today, and I mean today, there are 12,552 platinum open access journals for you to choose. And they are all listed in the directory of open access journals. 12,552 journals. So go to www.doaj.org. Publish in platinum open access journals. Do not pay to publish. Now, yes, in some fields, there may be a time in your career where you will have to pay to publish. I will not do so, and I never will. But at this point of your career, you got no money. Publish in platinum open access journals. Four, here we go. Investigate nitros non-traditional research outputs or objects and write for journals that enable mixed media presentations. It's very important to disseminate widely. We all know that. Students are producing posters, vlogs, blogs, podcasts, designs, photographs. All this material is absolutely terrific and it now has a name, or indeed a couple of names, nitros, non-traditional research outputs. In North America, the phrase is often more inelegantly, RSOR, <laughs> research, scholarly and artistic works, RSOR. This material in and of itself is great. So these are outputs in and of themselves. And remember, this includes, for example, for my great mates out there, great science photography. Got a lot of great mates who are 
brilliant photographers of bees, right? Amazing photographers of birds, you name it. Now, these are research outputs in themselves, have a section of your CV called nitros, right? Now, if you want to take the nitro and put it or render it into more traditional journal form, then you can now do that. This is, of course, the artifact exegesis model of research, if you will. So it means you're able to take your nitro and put it into more conventional research forms. Now, many of you know I do a lot of work on sound. You know, I'm one of those randoms that sort of walks through car parks with a microphone in the air. People go, what's she doing? She's recording a car park. Don't ask. But let's talk about the journals that work with this mixed media and mixed media materials. Let's just go to a couple for you. So design studies, a journal I love that looks at the design process from engineering right the way through to product design. We've got Media Res, incredible journal, multimodal online formations. It's really out there, fabulous. The Journal for Artistic Research, great peer review, great research, really good people to work with. The Journal of Visual Art Practices. Now, fantastic visual essays, really interesting here, and great on the social impact of research. The Journal of Design and Science, I think you know what the topic is by the title, but they're working strongly on building the relationship between design and science disciplines. And the Oxford Artistic and Practice-Based Research Platform. This is a whole other way of thinking about journals, it's very interesting. And they're moving between sound and vision, and they are really probing the limits of what is academic publishing. Fascinating enterprise, and one of my personal favourites, Visible Language, a journal that looks at evidence-based research and how humans innovate through technology. Okay, so how exciting is this area? So you take photographs as part of your research, you're a soundscape person <laughs> recording car parks, come on, you do design, building online, offline objects, you're recording podcasts, you're recording videos, you're doing posters. Remember, you created nitros, so put those on your CV under the heading, mm -mm, nitros, and then look at these great journals where you can take these artifacts and configure exegeses and make them into a more traditional or conventional refereed article. Five, be wary of book chapters. Okay, now book chapters are a mixed blessing for PhD students and indeed for the rest of us. The problem with book chapters for PhD students is that they take a long time to emerge. So you really need pretty well instant publications to get your career and your party going. Okay, so you can't wait, the lag will hurt you. You as a researcher also, you're invisible behind the name of an editor, and that's not good for your profile either. And also, sadly, book chapters have a low level of citation. So none of that's terribly useful for you. So if you want to get the PhD publication bus moving, then book chapters are probably not the way to go. Having said that, I want to talk about Springer and I want to talk about Emerald Publishers and Platforms to name two. And they've started to do, and they've done it for about four or five years, but they've started to cannibalize their publishing model. Now, that's not quite as brutalizing as it sounds, but what I mean is, uh, for Springer and for Emerald, they cut away the chapters in books so their chapters have a self standing life and identity. For example, they're automatically loaded like that onto Google Scholar. So that means they're available for individual purchase and download and citation. So they're a little bit more visible. Now, book chapters are listed on Google Scholar, less so on Scopus, but in some fields they are. The other great advantage of book chapters is that they are opportunistic publications. This is important. That means you often get the request to write a chapter in an area you wouldn't normally publish in and you're approached. It's not in your research plan, but it's an opportunity. Okay, so occasionally you'll be invited to be part of a key or really important book that creates a whole new discipline. It's happened once in my career, so it is rare. 
Uh, I was asked to contribute to the book Physical Cultural Studies. I get quite emotional. What an absolute privilege that was to be at the sort of start of an important new field. So that's an example where a book chapter is great and useful. But I've also had much more frequently really, really great work that's been buried as a book chapter and picked up very, very few citations. So if you can write a book chapter easily and qu quickly, then yep, go for it. But know that it will be a lagging publication and it will have low level of metrics. I think you've got better options, okay? Six, yep, write up conference presentations immediately. This is a rule that I've given myself and it has, can I say, for this year particularly, it's been a tough rule for me to follow. But what I ask is when you get the option to do a conference presentation or a keynote or a seminar, say yes. But then I want you to make a promise to yourself after that yes, that once you've said yes and you deliver it, you write it up immediately for referee publication. Because if you think about it, you've worked so incredibly hard to create something new and powerful. I want you to allow it to flower. I want it to find a big audience. So write it up, send it to a journal. And look, my problem this year is I've done so many keynotes, so many presentations. It's almost been one a week that I've got behind. So I think I'm about three behind at the moment to write it up. I'll catch up before Christmas and they'll come out next year. And my other rule, by the way, for conferences and presentations is, all, and I've always done this, always force yourself to write something new. So don't be one of those people that has a presentation and you deliver it five times or six times. That doesn't help your publishing. Make a decision each time you speak to deliver something new, which then creates a new publication. And that's great. It means you're producing and writing up new refereed research. Seven, treat rejection as a review and go again immediately. Okay. Now, I know all the stuff about Reviewer 2, and look, I am pretty lucky these days. Rejection happens very rarely to me now, but look, when I was a younger scholar, when I was a lass, uh, it was a tougher time for women in publishing, particularly in journal publishing. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I got a one-line review which said, women must not write about sport, or women can't write about football. That was the review, okay? So I learnt to manage the rejection of the review of my research. So I made deals with myself that, okay, I would get the reports back, would take a breath, and I would treat it as a privilege. So I would take the reviewer's feedback, I would ch make changes to the article, I would force myself to say, thank you, reviewer one, you have improved my article. Thank you, reviewer two, you have improved my article. And then, within 24 hours, I would send it out to the next journal. Okay, so this means you're keeping your publishing on track. What I need you to do is disconnect your emotions from publishing, okay? This is a job. This is a professional job, professional writing. Disconnect your emotions and take any comments that people are offering as a thank you, that's great, you've improved my research, make those changes, send it on the road again. And look, if the... <laughs> personal stuff does come in, and yes it does, then just get out those personal comments. What I do mentally is take out the personal comments. I like see myself in my head scrunching it up like a piece of rubbish, and then I create a bin fire. I love me a good bin fire. I create a bin fire in my head, and I get rid of the personal stuff. So go again. Keep the publishing train on the road. Eight, write SOS articles. Now, there's lots of tricks I'm going to give you now about how to really, really extract publications from your doctorate, but there's also a couple of tips I'm giving you that will enhance your employability enormously. So SOS is not a plea for help. Well, not really. It's a description of something called scholarship of supervision. Scholarship of supervision. This phrase describes the research and the publishing exploring doctoral supervision, doctoral studies. The research shows that the students who reflect on the process of completing a PhD are more likely to finish a PhD. And trust me, after the pandemic, 
we need scholarship of supervision about what went right, what went wrong, what we can do differently. So the publications in this area are gaining some really, really good early citations. A couple of tricks for you. Make sure you add pandemic PhD and COVID-19 studies to your keywords. So this area means that you can reflect on the completion of your doctorate, which of course helps your doctorate, but then you can read the research in this area and there's some great journals, which will then help the doctorate and create another publication for you. So this then gives you a new publication arm in your writing portfolio. Plenty of people talk about supervision, but it's an important corrective if you can publish in this field and confirm your expertise. So this means when you're searching for jobs and you see endlessly as an early career researcher, somebody says you need experience with PhD supervision and you're going, dude, I just finished my own thesis last year. What are you talking about? But what you can do is talk about your contributions to SOS, Scholarship of Supervision. These articles are very pleasant to write. And I'll give you an example. In my last job as Dean, I ran a, a weekly writing group for nearly six years called The Right Bunch. And it met on Friday mornings. It was absolutely fabulous. And just before I left the Dean role, I asked the members if they'd like to write a bit of sauce scholarship of supervision on the writing group and what they can do for doctoral students. The article was written very quickly in two weeks. It was published very quickly, a beautiful piece of writing. In fact, I've got more feedback uh, from people writing to me about that article than anything else this year. So all the members of that writing group gained an article completely independently from the topic of their thesis. And they then reflected on the doctorate, reflected on supervision, which increased their likelihood to finish. And just about all of them now have. Nine, write subtle articles. Now this area is so important. I wish I could talk to my 22 year old self and say, Tara, write subtle articles, subtle. Subtle is the scholarship of teaching and learning, subtle. Now, most PhD students teach during their candidature. They gain innovative experiences and you reflect on the critical literacies, the disciplinary literacies that you gain through an education. So that fantastically important material can become subtle. These publications are so important because they give you another pod of expertise outside of your thesis. But also, when you start to apply for not only academic posts, but the really large number of training posts that are available at the moment, you don't just talk about experience, oh, it's a tutor, this person, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you have the literature that confirms your expertise in this field. So I'll give you an example. In the last vlog series, you met a lot of wonderful people. We had a lot of people that came in to the vlog series, but two of the people you met near the end were Aidan and Alyssa, two wonderful ex-former students of mine, still good mates of mine. And they only met each other because they sort of both ended up with me as their supervisor accidentally. But they became amazing friends. They are amazing friends and I get quite emotional. It's lovely that these two humans, all sort of, because they're both very young, will know each other probably for 60 years after having that shared experience. But during COVID-19, the three of us ran a lot of learning and teaching gigs. And one of them was a, a reading group around Sarah Ahmed's book series. I think it was seven seminars. And so we ran seven seven weeks of seminars in this reading group and then Aidan, Alyssa and I decided to write a refereed article about the role of reading groups in understanding teaching and learning and also there was a fair amount of attention on the notion of the celebrity intellectual as well. It was a great piece, it was a three-hander, we all wrote a third of it, it was published quickly and it's already picking up all this citations. So this article was completely separate from their thesis, but it was subtle. And it meant that the pair of them picked up another article through their candidature. And can I say, uh, both Aidan and Alyssa were in work before their examiner reports were completed uh, on their thesis. That's how quickly they got into work. 
10. Work with your supervisor to cut chapters into two or three separate articles. This is the big one. The gift of supervision, the gift of picking a supervisor who's published everywhere, understands the publishing industry and knows how to write, is that they can take a chapter of your thesis and then split it into disparate parts and organize multiple publications from a single chapter. Now we talk a lot about how students lose out in publishing if they've got a toxic relationship with their supervisor. But this is a great example of where students can have their publications amplified by very good supervision while abiding by the research code of conduct. So if you have a big chapter, and most theses do, a big chapter that's doing a lot, <laughs> it might be an analysis chapter, it might be a methodology chapter, could be anything. And then what you and your supervisor can do, you can do it on your own too, but what you and your supervisor can do is create three separate parts from this big chapter and then make them all into individual articles. Now, I'm doing this right now with Narell and Jamie at the moment. So Narell gave me a chunk of her thesis. Like, here's a chunk. Where's it begin? Where's it end? Here's a chunk of the thesis. So what I did about three weekends ago is I read the chunk and I separated it into four separate articles that we're currently writing up into articles right now. In fact, two are finished, right? That's how quick it is. So remember, a thesis of 80,000 words is not simply eight articles. It can be so much more than that. A chapter can be more than one article, but it requires really careful planning and enabling the productivity of PhD students to show that each of these almost sections of a chapter can be a self-standing article. This is how real productivity from a PhD emerges, where sections of, of chapters can become complete articles. And it means no words are wasted in a PhD. 11. When you receive an opportunity or invitation, take it. This is important. Now, planning, we're going to talk about in a second, but planning is incredibly important for publications, absolutely. But you do need to organise your time and organise your publications. But it is important that you take opportunities. You say yes, yes, when these opportunities emerge. And these might include keynotes or invited talks or seminars, special issues of journals, for example. And these requests come out of nowhere. And when they emerge, say yes, say yes. They're not in the plan, but they enlarge your collegial network incredibly and provide, again, more publications on the CV. These are bonus publications, I call them. Most years of my career, I have one or two of them. This year has been weird. I don't know why, but I've had 15 of these sort of opportunistic publications and I've taken those options and I've sort of reorganized everything in my publishing this year, but that's okay. Say yes, work hard, take advantage of that opportunistic publication. You've been given a publishing windfall, grab it. 12, create a couple of new sections of your CV. Published, under review, currently being written. Let me explain this one. Something I did to my CV while I was completing my PhD. So when I was just starting out and was building, I was building up what would be my academic CV and I put headings in. And often some of these headings that I was putting in had nothing under them yet, okay? But they were aspirational headings. Um, like I put in books, it didn't have any books, but books, book chapters, articles, you know, I also had podcasts and photography and stuff. But after those sections, I added two more under review and currently being written. Now I did this and I do this and have these headings for myself. So I'm keeping track of the publishing. Remember, we're moving these articles around. We need to know where they are. But also 
those headings give you momentum because you can see the excitement of the movement of ideas from submission to publication. That's terrific. It also ensures your CV is dynamic. Even at an early stage of your career, you're seeing the movement. And it also allows the people who hire you to see that you are a self-starter and that they're hiring someone with a plan. Yeah, so the PhD is not the end of your career, it is the start of your career, so show the trajectory of that career in your CV. Make yourself feel like every day you're doing something. So you're going to be writing these, so currently being written, these are under review and these are published. 13. Internationalise your research, your publications and your profile. The academic world is big and it's exciting and it is so so much more than Europe and North America. Five years ago and helped by the directory of open access journals I made an overt decision as a senior academic to support academics, support universities, support journals, support countries that suffered from low collaboration and low citation rates. About six years ago some data sets emerged about the nations where there are low collaborations, right, and there are low citations. And I thought, that's not fair, that's not right. We talk about globalisation, well, how about we front up and we make a difference, right? So I now have made a decision to referee for journals outside of Europe and outside of North America, and I make a decision every year to publish in widely different nations. So I make a deal with myself every year that I will keynote and I will publish in at least 10 different nations every single year. And can I say, this decision I made only six years ago changed my life. I've met so many interesting people. I've learned so much. And I've seen actually, to be frank, the most professional refereeing, copy editing, publication of my life. And this year, you know, just to give you three examples, I've published in Algeria, Saudi Arabia and Indonesia for the first time, best refereeing and professional handling of copy editing I've seen, and I'm 53. Okay, so let's all make a decision to stop pretending that international higher education only exists in Europe and in North America, and let's publish in the big, wide, wonderful world out there. And this international network is useful for your publishing, but trust me, also incredibly useful for your grants, for your funding, for really significant collaborations. 14. Find new areas to publish in independently. Okay, this is a tough one. Uh, particularly if you don't know about it. So say you've come from a lab, you've been socialised into particular models of co-authorship or indeed in some areas of the medical sciences, they had to invent the phrase mass authorship because it's got so bonkers. But say you've had a poor supervisor, okay? You were not inducted or oriented properly into a doctoral program and when the thesis was finished, you were simply dropped or dumped by the lab. So for some students, PhD by publication, the supervisor's got every publication that that person can get out of you and then you just dumped. So what happens now? And this is a very common situation. I receive between five and 10 emails every single week explaining this exact story. Okay, so the first thing to realize when you go, what do I do now? Okay, I've got nothing, what do I do now? The first thing to realize is that the reality that you believe exists in one discipline doesn't exist in other disciplines. And further, the reality in your discipline at the moment is not what it used to be and is not what it's gonna be. The best operators I know, and I've seen when their ability to produce research as they're used to producing research, that goes away. The two best examples I've ever seen of people starting again and well are vice chancellors. I had two great vice chancellors in my career. And when they became vice chancellor, of course, they lost their lab. They lost all the sort of ways they used to produce publications. And so they reinvented themselves, these two vice chancellors, to write about higher education studies and also higher education leadership. This was brilliant. This was inspirational. And we can all learn from their example. And I always look at the conditions in which I am currently located. I always 
have a good hard look at the limitations that I currently have. And remember, a lot of my career, like now, okay, I'm moving between countries, living in temporary accommodation, I've got nothing. I've got nothing, okay? And so all I've got at the moment is my laptop computer and an iPad to read my Kindle books, okay? And so I could go, oh, it's all too hard, I won't bother, but no, come on, look at what is possible. And I'd advise you, for example, start writing up that subtle, start writing up that sauce. You don't need anybody else, you can do that on your own, but also think about these really interesting interdisciplinary relationships between science communication, business communication, nursing communication. You can write all of that material on your own or leadership studies, followership, followership studies, just to give you a couple of other examples. So think about your limitations. OK, and you know what? Turn those limitations into a strength. Come on. What can you write on on your own today? And by moving your thesis just to the side and finding a new relationship, you're able to keep publishing. Remember, the goal is keep publishing. Keep adding articles to Google Scholar. Don't focus on what you can't do. Focus on what you can do and create a new pod of publishing for yourself. Fifteen. Remember to use the examination period. The examination period of a doctorate, at best, can take eight weeks. It frequently takes a lot longer than that. And I always tell the horror stories because they're mine to tell. My research masters took an entire year, a year to examine, and my PhD took five months. So the key is absolutely get the thesis finished knowing that you'll have this key period during the examination process to get stuff out in journals. So everything we've talked about today, you can use the examination period and really pump this stuff out. So yes, submit your thesis and celebrate. Drink your own weight in Chardonnay if that's what you want to do. Fantastic. Party on Garth. But then stop recalibrate and go full throttle into the PhD publishing mode. Get every article out of that thesis that you can. Use the low hanging fruit argument. What's the easiest? Get the easiest ones out first. So all those chapters that can become articles in a day, get them all out in the first week. Then look at the chapters that can be split up into multiple articles. Then you get a wog off, which is my new phrase, wog off. Write one, get one free. <laughs> and work on those with your supervisor. You can do them on your own if you like too, but work on them with your supervisor. Any conference presentations or seminars you haven't written up, mm -hmm, write them up now. Your scholarship of supervision. Reflect on your PhD candidature. Write that one up now. Yeah, do not let the examination pass with you sort of being stressed and worried and frightened and rocking from side to side going, oh, I wonder what's going to happen. Let that go. Treat the examination period as your post-thesis boot camp. Get active. Get your ideas mobile. Get moving. Come on. Come on. For example, let's use the one from Narelle once more. She submitted her PhD and we we're in the middle of COVID when Narelle finished. And Narelle, Jamie and I produced an article in response to a call for papers on COVID and higher education. So she was under examination, this thing popped up. And we each wrote a third of it. It was done in, three, in two weeks, I had two weekends, was done in two weeks pretty well. And it was called Panic Learning. Panic Learning. Great article, already picked up nine citations. So this was not in an area of Narelle's thesis, but we used the time, used the opportunity, used the call for papers, and didn't get stressed about the examination. Just parked it, let it go, keep publishing. So we went for it. We had a ball, can I say, and Narelle still describes it as the best writing and publishing experience of her life. So use the examination period well. It is a boot camp for your brain, a pathway to your future. And let's move to the last one, 16. Use 
the annual publishing whiteboard. Now, every year since my master's degree, 1992, I've prepared the next year of my publishing on a whiteboard. Now, I split the whiteboard, as you can see, into three sections, to be written, under review, and published. So each year and every day of that year, I have a visual reminder of my goals. I can see my achievements as publications cascade down the board. So I finish one from the top, it goes under review, it gets published. So the whiteboard is incredibly active through the year. Now, we have just over a month until the new year starts. I'm recording this in November, 2022. So together, why don't we use this month to plan our publications for the year? As you can see, my, my old whiteboard that was the original one is in storage. So Jamie, my beautiful husband, has bought me a new whiteboard <laughs> in the temporary accommodation so that we can do it together. Okay, so let's do this together. Let's plan out our publications and have a session where we talk about it and we get it right for each other. So I want you to be expansive when you're thinking about what's going to go on your whiteboard. Use all the tips we've talked about today. Don't just hope for the future. Plan for the future. And this will also allow you to plan your year and plan every day. And I would argue the whiteboards are probably the best for that process because you can see the cascading of your publications. You gain also, can I say, a real sense of achievement as you sort of wipe it out from one section and move it down the board. It's amazing. So how about, near the, we're near the end of the year, we hold a live session for all of us to get together and you can talk to me and talk to everybody else about your whiteboards, your publishing plans. If you think that's a good idea, let me know. Let's do it. Let's have a blast. Let's have a great time. So thank you to the wonderful Ella for this suggestion and I hope these 16 strategies will focus you, will help you and together we can plan a different academic future. I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out.